All right. Um, yeah, camera issues are the problem. I think I got the sound part figured out, but the device just keeps freezing up. So there's that. All right. Yeah. You actually don't need to see me flat my face, do you? <laughs> yes. All right, so um, the camera will either work or it won't. I was actually a little afraid before I started because um, I had a I had to restart my computer, and my computer has decided it hates me with a passion, and it's decided to fight me. So every time I restart it, it takes about a half hour. So I don't even want to know what it's doing right now. Um, all right, with that being said, you don't care about what I have to say. You're more interested in learning about how we can use... Uh, education, or how we can use gaming in the classroom. Right? Right. That's what I'm here for. That's what you're here for. So, um, additionally, the first thing is that, for me, I don't really have, like, a, a set, like, slideshow to share with you. It's more or less just, like, experiences and questions and how you're using them. I want to start by going through the... I want to start by going through the different age levels and uses for gaming. Okay, so as a hobby, gaming is one of the best things that we could ask for. It's easy, it's simple, it keeps people busy, and hey, that might have actually worked. Um, and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's all of those things, but it has a lot of a lot of other uses outside of that. So starting with the youngest age, I don't know what age. Um, oh wow, that was a bad place to freeze. Um, I don't know what age many of you are using, uh, many of you are working with, but the age group that I started with is my own children. When they were three or four years old, I started giving them dice and they had to identify the number that they rolled. So it was just basic number identification. As they grew older, um, we started doing math and my kids actually had to, and you can't see air quotes cause the camera's being stupid, but they had to earn their dice. And by earning their dice, what that meant for them is that they had to they had to add two dice together. So I rolled they'd roll two d4s, and if they rolled the two d4s and it came out at whatever it was, then they would say, "Okay, so it was a three and a two. Okay, I add them together, I get four, and they would do it right, and they would have to earn. And if they did it enough times in a row, they could actually eventually earn their dice." My kids are super proud of the dice that they have. Um, my daughter was like freaked out that she might have lost one when we went to a con recently. Um, but we, we found it. It actually ended up falling into our backpack. So it was pretty awesome. Um, but the, the reality is when it comes to age, um, you can start low and work your way up. But, oh man, no camera. This is not awesome. Okay, you're gonna. I'm gonna work with. It. Oh, by the way, disclaimer: when it comes to everything we do, uh, don't engage in in digital piracy or theft of copyrighted works. That's just not cool. So I'm gonna actually back out of this for a moment, and I'm gonna go into here. Um, my camera's not working, so I'm kind of out of luck on this. I was gonna show you guys some books and things like that. I'd even made a very cool, um, like full screen version of this, but they just look at my dumb face. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and look at this. Uh, first thing I want to want to show you that's really amazing, um, if you're starting with young kids and it comes to that. Well, actually, real quick poll in the in the chat. Um, what age group are many of you looking to work with? Uh, get that if you want to put that out there while I while I quickly look up this new tool that came out one to five. Great. I love those kids. Seven ish. So younger. All right, seven is my daughter's age, so you're right there. All ages, youth services librarian, super cool. Um, nine to ten year old, so we're all looking. Yeah. Well, I didn't intend this just for educators. To, well, Eleven to thirteen. All right, so we got that. Um, adventure guides. So I don't know if you've seen the Young Adventurers guides, but Jim Zub who 
is a genius behind Rick and Morty, uh, or Dungeons and Dragons versus Rick and Morty. Um, that Jim Zub also made a set of books. Oh, this is neat. They just announced a new one. Um, Beasts and Bahamas. These are a series of books that are a light introduction to D&D. You have warriors and weapons, which is exactly what it sounds like. You learn about some basic classes. Um, one of the things I like about them, and I again, camera sucks, can't show you, um, is that it it almost reads like an encyclopedia, but there's no stats, so it doesn't really matter. You know, a lot of us, a lot of the players of D and D are are stats junkies. We love to know what the stats are, but the most stats you'll get out of these books, like monsters and creatures, my kids walked around with this book in their hand for God, a couple of weeks. And all right, let's read an excerpt. Oh no, that's a terrible excerpt. Show me a page. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna play. We're gonna play like that, huh, Google? Um, so, uh, oh, not ad, adventurer's guide. There we go. And let's go to Google images. See if I can get me some pages. All right. This is what we all needed to see in our life. A black dragon. Um, oh, mistakes were made. Um, so one of the things it shows you when you look at the, uh, when you look at the creatures here is, Oh, sweet. That's high res. All right. I can open that or not. Is it gives you a rating. It tells you a little bit about sizes, um, layer. It gives you a description of the creature. It gives you a comparison. So, oh, sorry. You're in the, oh, I didn't load the virtual meeting room. I am so sorry. Okay. So I had computer issues. Sorry, Commander Pete. I was having major computer issues here. My camera is completely borked at the moment. And then I and I had to restart the computer, and I was afraid it was going to die. So uh, I'm sorry. I got, I'm getting that up right now. I was so, so focused on getting everything else unbroken. Um, let me get, go to connect is loading. So don't worry. Um, which, by the way, I'm a tech person, so running into these problems is even more embarrassing than normal. I'm just going to have to go no camera. All right. Um, there we go. Now attendees are able to join. Um, all right, people are joining. Sweet. All right, let me mute, mute my mic in there because, well, yeah, I'll have my mic on. All right, so um, sorry about that. I'm I'm <laughs> really bad at computering right now. Um, so with all of that, the Young Adventurers Guides are a good starting book. But what's great about them is that they allow... Oh, hey, it's not just me. It's videos not rendering for other, I don't know. Uh, the Young Adventurers guys allow for the kids to use their imagination and what they're creating instead of just being pure stats-based. The CR rating is at one, one through five and then epic for things like Strahd um, or Demogorgon or Tiamat or anything like that. But it's not just it's not just solely the Monsters and Creatures guide that has those kind of stats. <laughs> Oops. It's not just... I'm hearing so feedback from somebody. Hold on. Nemeth, I think. Sorry. Mute, 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 mute. All right. Um, by the way, if any of you had that on your conference call, bingo, uh, that might help. Um, the Dungeons and Tombs also has like a major creature. So, for example, they go through... Um, they go through the like, oh, what is it? Um, the giants, and they have the they have the fire giant layer, and you have all those cool things. And the nice thing is that they actually in the books they'll ask you questions. They're like, okay, so you've come across a creature that can tell whether you are being honest or not, and the flump wants to know, you know, the flump wants to know if your if your intentions are good. And so what, you know, what are your intentions? What will it know? And that kind of thing. Or you come across, you come across a person on the road who appears to be hurt. Do you rob them for the materials they have? Or do you, you know, do you avoid them? Do you gank them? What are you going to do? Uh, do you help them? 
And those are all options. That, and the thing is that they're open ended enough and well written so that kids can actually uh, so the kids can actually like engage with them. Uh, but beyond just the Young Adventures books, there's a lot of other things out there. I mean, if you ever hand a kid a monster manual, you're going to see that kid have the time of their life. They're going to go through that thing and just just devour it. And that's where you can start messing with math. So one of the things that uh, when it comes to math that I like to do is once I do give my kids the stats. And by the way, I'm a I forgot to say this earlier. Uh, I'm an educator. And part of that is that I work I worked with middle school students. But now I work with actually um, pre-K all the way up through, I think, age 26 is now where we cut off um, adults because we have um, students with extra needs programs, um, life skills and things like that. So I work at a therapeutic day school. So a lot of the students I work with, um, they, they're looking for that kind of that kind of output for their energy. So the system doesn't matter. D&D doesn't matter. It's the engaging the kids and they and, and it's engaging the kids in what they're doing. It's engaging their their minds. It's getting them thinking. It's getting them writing. Um, one of the problems that I hear though from people frequently is that oh you know D and D is violent or murder hobos or like if I don't want to have my kids just go beat stuff up for gold and treasure, you know what am I gonna what am I gonna have them do? And there's a lot of answers to that. Be creative. Uh, first off. Your kids may not be murder hobos right off the bat. That's just a possibility. I'm not saying they won't be. My kids actually kind of turned out to be murder hobos. But one of the things that I did to help them is that we created a game where they were essentially like intergalactic zookeepers. And we just went and they had to figure out what the habitat was for an animal and how to track it and hunt it down. And then they had to safely get it so they could bring it home to a zoo. Intergalactic zookeepers does not have a whole lot of murder hoboing. Um, it's a great fun way. And you can actually start using it to, to teach your kids about other environments. You can teach, um, you can teach about um, like cities. Like what is the, what is the animal life in, like in a city? Cities aren't devoid of animal life. Trust me. Anyone who's ever almost kicked a pigeon knows that, but you can also go, okay, well, what lives in a desert? If it's a desert, what are the characteristics of the desert? How are you, how can you use that? to teach the kids. Okay. So if we know a desert is going to be hot and we're looking for animals during the day, what, what things should we look for? Oh, that, that stand of rocks is a good one to look for. Those are good things to do when it comes to it. And you can really play it in a lot of different ways. Um, how you play it is going to totally be dependent on, on the ability level and interest of your kids. The, the next thing that I want to talk about, um, when it comes to, um, working with kids is that, there's an aspect of Dungeons and Dragons that we don't realize that kids truly need gaming, I should say, rather than D and D. And that is the social modeling aspect of this. Uh, if you're not familiar with what social modeling is, it's the idea that what we're teaching the kids is how to be a human. So when you go to a store, um, how do you, how do you engage with somebody? How do you buy something? How do you, how do you act with people? If you're at a party, how do you like what? What do you? How do you greet somebody? Should you bring something? Things like that. Um, when I work with students who are, I have students who are uh, with emotional disorders and things along those lines, and they had a variety of a variety of reasons that they weren't uh, comfortable in standard social situations. By creating a safe, controlled environment where they weren't actually being exposed to other people, I was able to teach a lot of the skills that we were struggling to teach them elsewhere. And that's kind of an amazing thing. If you have that ability to to create a safe environment where they can make mistakes, but it's with somebody they feel comfortable with, they understand that. For example, if somebody's mean to you, obviously in gaming, if somebody's being a jerk to you, your first response is, I punch them in the face. Okay, cool. In your story, that might work. And that might be the might be how your game is played. But if you're social modeling, that's not the answer. Punch the person who's mean in the face is not the answer. And you can actually use a game to teach social modeling in that way for any age group. Uh, for example, I was able to safely teach my kids that a wounded animal is dangerous to approach uh, because we were doing the intergalactic zoo. They wounded an animal. And when they got near it, it lashed out at them. That wasn't the animal's fault necessarily. 
it was just doing what animals do, but it was a way of teaching them that you have to be careful because you may want to go help that raccoon that, you know, got hit by a car, but, or the dog or whatever. But on the other hand, it's going to bite you. It's hurt and it's angry. So, I mean, that kind of any sort of like situation modeling, behavior modeling, it's a great teaching tool working with kids. And the fun thing is there's a lot of systems out there uh, beyond just your standard D20 system that are great. You have, um, oh, what are they called? The fate dice or um, decision dice, whether the plus minus or blank that you can work with. There's systems out there that are fairly simple. Um, I think it's like Panda Ninja Taco is a good game where you can do that. There's a handful of other systems that are simpler that just use D6s. Using something like that is simple for the kids uh, to work with because I like using the, the, the standard adventure dice, but I also like something that my kids are going to be able to engage with without having to think. So when I first give them their characters and we first play, they're only rolling D20s. But then when you move forward, um, you can start introducing them to character sheets or abilities, and then they give them other dice, and they get that. Um, but one of the things that I've done with my kids is now that they've got full character sheets, I go, okay, so you roll a 14 on the dice. Uh, you have a plus three to that skill. Uh, what is the total? And I'm still messing with math. And if they if they get the math wrong, they actually don't get the bonus, which has hurt them in game quite a few times. Uh, my my daughter is ready to murder my son because he keeps missing his uh, he keeps missing some of his attacks because he can't do the math on his bonus. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of a an overview there. That's playing with your kids. Now the other option is creating an environment where your kids can play with you, allowing them to do the research, allowing them to be the creators. Back to the Young Adventures books, these uh, these books give a lot of like like foundational groundwork. And by the way, I'm not being paid for by Wizards of the Coast. I wish I was. Um, I just buy them and I like them. But any book you give your kids, they can turn a story into. My daughter has made a Harry Potter game for us, and it's kind of like Calvin Ball. There are no established rules. It's all kind of made up in her head. But she's doing a heck of a job of making sure that we get um, – that the players get rewards and have a fear of failure without necessarily always either having everything be easy or everything being deadly. And I think that's a good balance that you can teach them. There's a little bit of research that goes into creating your own game. And the best thing is eventually you can just give the kids a game and have them play with each other. I don't know about you guys. My first game was Hero Quest. Long before I had d and I had Hero Quest. I had the box and all that stuff. And I... I set up the dungeons and I and I, I played with my friends and I never once read the rules and we had a good time. We told stories and we walked around and we hit stuff. It was neat. Um, but eventually I did learn the rules. I did learn to play. And that kind of turned into me eventually being the DM. Yeah. The uh, Hero Quest, it's a, it's a classic. I wish I still had my copy of it. I wonder if my parents have it somewhere. Um, but with those things, giving your kids a chance to, to do their own research and to build their own stories and make their own things. Imagine if you gave your kid a, a, a story prompt as a writing assignment. If you said to your kid, Hey, give me five pages on what would happen if somebody stole, um, your favorite necklace, your kid would look at you and be like, no, no, uh, uh-uh. but you say to your kids, Hey, I want to play, let's play D and D or let's play, you know, Dr. Who, or let's play, I don't know, whatever, pick a game. And I want to play it with you and let's have a story where the queen's necklace was stolen. What would happen? Like, what would be the outcome? I guarantee you the wheels in your kid's head is going to start spinning and they're going to start writing a story and you're going to get your five pages or more out of them without any difficulty. They're going to research. They're going to look into things. They're going to be like, well, where should we go? What should we do? Like any of those things, it's all amazing what you can get out of it. And what you're doing is you're teaching through that. Um, and then the, the best part is after you play, if they make a story, you got to ask the question, what went right? What went wrong? What would we do differently? Those questions 
are are the foundations of learning. That's the mortar that holds the bricks of learning together is what went right. Because the first thing is to acknowledge we had success. When you're teaching with gaming, what did we do right? What were the things, what were the steps? Not the things that were cool, but what were the things that we did right? Like, oh, we looked for traps before we went into the room. And that's why we didn't, you know, alert the thieves that we were there. So we were able to surprise them. Well, that went right. What went wrong? Um, what went wrong is we accused the first person we met of being a bad guy when he wouldn't give us information instead of, you know, why did he not give us information? And what could we do differently? Uh, I think differently next time, maybe we could take a little bit of time before we rush into the room and see where everything is. Okay, cool. That's learning right there. And that's not just simply learning how to play a game. That's learning how to work in life. Because each one of those things, what did we do right? Oh, we looked for traps. Okay. That's teaching a kid that, hey, before you rush into something, why don't you look for what can go wrong? The, the, the what could go wrong? Oh, we accused the first person, you know, who didn't want to help us. That teaches you empathy. Like, hey, if a person's not doing something, why is it? Are you asking nicely? Are you, are you, how are you presenting what you're asking them? Do they maybe have something else going on? Teaching empathy is a great one of the greatest skills that you can get out of gaming. And the third part being, what would we do differently? Well, maybe we'd look for, we'd maybe look a little more to see the layout of things. It's that slowing down and taking time before you start working. Because those of you who are educators know that if you say there's a worksheet coming at the end, the kids are going to like, just, they won't focus on anything you're saying. There's gonna be some kids who are either cringing in horror that they're gonna have to do work or other kids who are vibrating like a violin string who can't wait to get that worksheet in front of them so they can finish it and show you how smart they are. Those are two ends of the spectrum. And, but the thing is that with both of those things, you're not learning. The kids aren't listening anymore. They just know the worksheets there. If we can get them to slow down, we'll actually get better work out of them. Um, in my own classroom experience, one of the things that I did is to improve the quality of my students work is I didn't give them due dates. I actually just rewarded them for being done earlier by giving them cooler things to do. I gave them cool projects. They could do more stuff with a robot that we were building or other stuff. I gave them, I gave them positive reinforcement by giving them things that were enjoyable. Um, and one of the other things that I did is when I, when I took out the prize for being the first one done by saying, Hey, you did a great job on this, but here are the areas that you could improve on. Go back and take a look. I taught my students to slow down. And the amazing thing is that when I taught them to slow down, they actually got done faster because they made less mistakes. And that was a skill that you can also teach uh, with gaming. If you slow down, you're going to screw things up a lot less. And that's the thing I actually wish I could teach some adults. Uh, beyond that, I've kind of covered a lot of my, my things that I wanted to, to hit just off the bat. And I was hoping for a little more back and forth interaction, but the internet is being stupid. Um, do any of you guys have questions and then hopefully we can answer them. Also, if you're on the, if you're on, uh, the go to meeting and you want to ask that way, just unmute yourself and you just, just kind of give me like a little, Hey, you know, pick me. Or if you're on, uh, Discord or discord, sorry. Uh, if you're on Twitch chat, go ahead and throw a message in there. So by the way, if you guys haven't, um, if you're not a regular part of Gary Con, you just happen to come across what's going on. Make sure you check out GaryCon because that's what this is for right now. And we also have a GaryCon uh, Discord server, which I have not posted into the. Um, hold on, I have not posted into the thing in quite a while, so let me do that. So let's see if there's anybody over in the. Ooh, uh, nope, nope. I, I'm an old person. Technology is hard. Um, <laughs> if anybody has a. If anybody has a, um, a question that they would like to throw in there, otherwise this is going to be a very short seminar, but I love answering questions. So, oh, which by the way, in my own stream, if you have anything that you'd like to suggest, uh, please go ahead and do that because, or I have a link to anything. I've enabled uh, link sharing in my chat because I don't care if people share links. I don't know why that's a thing that's by default off. So I think it's neat that people share stuff. All right, one second. I, I see do it. have a question. Hey, yes, sorry. Go for it. Hi. Yeah, I'm the librarian in the chat. Awesome. So, 
Hi. Um, I do have a question. I have a couple kids who are really into Dungeons and Dragons right now who have never played a game. All right. Uh, they're between the ages of nine years old and 17. Okay. How, uh, how would I be able to bring that into my library if I wanted to start a group? Would I be able to have the teenager and the young kid in the same group or? Yes. Well, okay. So um, to answer that question, there's a, there's a lot of steps to that. First off, um, clear it with, obviously clear it with your library management, starting like a club or a group or something like that with it. It's important that the group be mentored to start with. One of the things that I did when I started a, um, also, this also will ask, answer Tim Lenz's question as well. One of the things I did when I started a, I actually accidentally started a D and D club at the school that I worked at as a middle school. I had, a, um, I was coaching the cybersecurity team. And one of the things I found is that my kids weren't cohesing. They weren't acting as a team. They were all acting as, as Mavericks and nobody wanted to work together, which is important. Cybersecurity is working together. Um, so what happened is we created D and D as a way of um, team building. I started out as the DM and I ran the first part of the module of Lost Minds of Fendelver. And by the time they cleared the Goblin Cave, uh, the Goblin Cave and killed the Knoll, they were, the kids were itching to take over for themselves. So by modeling the, the, the DM's behavior and how you run a session, you'll get away from the thing that we all ran into, or many of us have run into in our lives is you have somebody who wants to DM the game. It's usually the, and when I was a kid, it was the person who had the books because I didn't have the books. Um, but I had a friend who had the books and he wanted to DM. But what it turned out was he just wanted us to all come over to his house and he would show us how smart he was by killing us over and over again because, you know, we didn't see the trap there or whatever. And that's not, that's not the type of behavior we want to have um, in a DM. So by modeling the right type of behavior, uh, empathy, compassion, listening, you can, uh, it, it will, that type of model will set the stage for future kids going. Now, as far as materials and things like that, I am biased to D and D beyond because they give stuff away for free. And I am going to um, try to quickly find the, the link for D and D beyond. Cause I know that they have a, um, like a Zendesk form that you fill out and they'll give away free materials. But the other thing that happens um, when you're creating a club or an organization for something like that, it's not just materials, but it's also um, creating behavior. So you may want to try starting with something like monster of the week, because even adults have a hard time showing up every week to a game to get everybody there. I know we've all experienced it at some point in our life. So if you have something that's a little lower stakes or it's not an ongoing campaign, but it's more like a situation of the week, a scenario of the week, you can use, um, you can use scenarios. For example, uh, there's a blog on DD beyond that James Hay writes called encounter of the week. And he gives you essentially like one hour encounters that you can run and it's got everything you need and it's free and it's online. So those are things that, um, uh, D&D Beyond, Free Tools, Schools. Um, sorry. Education, not schools. So what you can do with that is you can get kids starting playing with that, and it's low stakes. Eventually, they're going to want to write their own... Um, Eventually, they're going to want to write their own games. They're going to want to do their own things, and that's great. But what you're going to have to do is get them at least started, and that's the modeling portion of it. As far as the teenager with the younger kids, yeah. I mean, gauge the teenager. Use your use your best judgment. I, I always worry in situations like that, but I've also seen a lot of mentoring happen. I mean, I grew up. I was, I was a young kid who had teenagers mentoring him. And by the time I got to high school, I mean, I had friends who were 22 when I was a sophomore in high school because they were the older kids in the neighborhood that grew up like hanging out with them. And that was fine. But just because my situation was fine, doesn't mean that it's always fine for everybody. So I always, I hesitate to give a blanket statement of it's awesome when it may not be. 
Um, all right, so then let's see. We had some other ones in the chat. Uh, have you played diceless games with any of the kids similar to your daughter's freeform game? Yes, I have played diceless games. And one of the things, there's a lot of a lot of ways you can go about diceless games. It's very improv. A lot of the lessons that you learn from being a teacher about engaging your students, and a lot of the lessons you could learn in improv are also excellent for mastering working with kids. Is the yes and, or the no but. So you're like, okay, um, yeah, yes and is, is by far one of the best skills, especially for working with kids. Like my kids will come up to me and they'll be like, dad, there's a dragon in the garage named Phil. And I'm like, yes, and he's only happy if he's being fed hot Cheetos. And they're like, yes. So building off of the ideas that they have, it validates what they've done, uh, the idea that they've come up with. And you're like, if they're like, my other kids, you know, they'll be like, hey, dad, can we go to um, Six Flags? I'll be like, no, but we can look we can look at how roller coasters are designed. And from there, we can figure something out. It's it's not necessarily a it's not even when you say no, you're still giving them something else. Um, it's a way of it's a way of encouraging the behavior without necessarily taking away without necessarily taking away their, their, oh my gosh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Um, autonomy, but that's not the word I'm looking for. Oh my God, my brain is hurting already. Sorry, this Gary Khan virtual is actually harder than being Gary Khan in person. Um, and here's the link, by the way, in the, in the Twitter chat, and I'll put it in the, um, in the go to meeting chat as well for uh, accessing, if you're an education organization or a library, accessing some of the free tools through agency. Thank you. God, why could I not think of that? Um, that link is for going to D and D beyond and they'll provide free tools, uh, through their service, uh, as an account. And I've used that to get neat stuff. Also, uh, secret about D and D beyond and probably why I'm biased towards them is last year at Gary Khan, they had a, a dev update, um, seminar that they did kind of like this and they gave everybody who attended a free legendary bundle so that's like 600 bucks worth of stuff so i was pretty excited about that one um diceless games yes suggestions starting a dnd club we did that created a game called fairy tales and friends um at my play-based learning center that sounds awesome by the way if anyone's interested uh there is a and i will find i will i will you can hit me up on, um, you can uh, private message me on Twitch, or you can hit me up on Discord uh, for Gary Khan. There is a really great fairy tale adventure story that teaches computer um, computer programming concepts without with but being program language agnostic, it just teaches the concepts of like if then else and that kind of stuff or Boolean searching. Um, I can get you the information on that. Not everybody's interested in computer programming. Uh, play-based learning center. We covered math, critical thinking, empathy, and memory skills. Fairy tales. Yeah. Fairy tales make great story props. Uh, I also like to ask my kids, um, give them a backpack full of adventure props. Yeah. You can do anything you need um, with that kind of stuff. One of my favorite things to do is, it's the thing we all do. Like you've sat around the counter and you're like, okay, so Batman versus Superman, who's going to win? You know, like it's easy. Or Hulk, Hulk versus Superman, who would win? Um, one of the things you can do is also ask your kids once they get used to a system, be like, Hey, stat out this character. So for example, my daughter was walking, watching Pocahontas this morning and she actually turned to me. She's like, would Pocahontas be a Druid? And I'm like, Hmm, I can see it. Or a nature cleric, one of the two. And you know, you just sit there and you start thinking about it and it gives them the opportunity to critically evaluate it. The, the thing that my seven-year-old, my five-year-old is not on this train yet, but my seven-year-old, I just taught her about alignment. And oh my gosh, she, she is absolutely obsessed with alignment right now. It is the most interesting thing in the world to her. But the other thing is, um, when I worked with uh, students with special needs, they, they naturally understood alignment, but they couldn't see it in other people. And it took a while for them to, to really understand how to identify alignment in others. And it's, it, it teaches empathy. Um, for example, there's, there's many great examples of 
of people who are they they play a character and they misunderstand something like good or evil or things like that because a lawful good character can actually still do evil things even while maintaining being lawfully good it's just one of those things like for example people always wonder about that one what if uh was the guard in aladdin wrong when he was going to punish aladdin for stealing is he still being lawful good he was a guard he saw somebody steal something he was going to punish the person that's lawful good you would do that in a DD game but it turns out that in a movie aladdin he's the bad guy so is he good or bad you know it's that kind of question Aladdin was just trying to feed himself and he gave half the bread to kids. He did a good thing. So two lawful good people can do something but oppose each other. Their types of good can oppose each other and seem bad to the other. And there's a there's a definite learning. Anyone who teaches like literacy and um, and story structure will understand that that's a very tough concept for kids to grasp until you can find a way to actually get them there. So not sure if you're familiar with it. Uh, according to um, uh, Fairy New York City, I'm guessing, NYC. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but One Page Dungeon Contest is great for kids who are interested in developing short adventures. It's system agnostic. My nine-year-old with some pretty severe learning disabilities has entered two years in a row. No, that sounds awesome. Is there a link to it? Should I look it up? Uh, you said it's called One Page Dungeon Contest. That sounds amazing. Um, anything you can, any sort of like writing things, um, anything you can do that engages a kid's mind is sounds fantastic. Uh, one page dungeon contest definitely sounds like it fit that category. Um, I'm already on it. Uh, Reddit, 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 Reddit. A lot of one page dungeon stuff. 2013, 2017. Okay. Oh, cool. Uh, the archive.org has a lot of stuff too. Um, Neat. You beat me to it. So those kinds of things are excellent. Any chance you can any chance you can find to engage kids, especially contests. Oh man, you never see a kid work so hard when it's not for a grade, but it's just to for, to to win against their friends. It is a really great it's a really great opportunity to see kids um, put in all their effort. Beyond that, um, I'm trying to think. Does anyone else have any other any other questions? So by the way, I apologize in advance for all of the uh, technical difficulties I had today. Yesterday's stream was phenomenally easy. The technology was working perfectly. Today, it fell on its face. So that's computers for you. Uh, in fact, I even made the mistake of not having recorded this stream, although I do have some technical wizardry that I might be able to still download it anyway. It's kind of weird that I might have to hack my own, pirate my own stream, but whatever. Um... Is that why I couldn't play it? Um, not sure why you couldn't play, couldn't play the stream, or yesterday's. Uh, do you have any difficult writing these adventures out to teach these lessons? I am, okay. So, I'm the worst person when it comes to keeping notes. I did a really good job on my current campaign. I'm running for some friends. I kept notes most of the time after we played about what happened. I don't write a lot of things in, in advance. I'm a very improv DM, which is very taxing at times. Um, for example, there's a note I have that I held up yesterday for a game that I'm running where the only note I have coming up for this new new campaign I'm running is there's a, uh, a dwarf in drag named Madam Damage. That is literally the only campaign note I have going into it. I'm not sure how it's going to work out. But generally, the players have fun. And... The thing is that it's, it kind of goes back to the yes and and no but. I play off what the players are looking for, and I ask them to be collaborative storytellers with me. Uh, it won't just yesterday's. Oh, yes, uh, on YouTube. Okay, uh, hit me up, uh, McLaren One. Hit me up after this on a on a direct message, and I'll see if I can get you the link. I played it on YouTube and it worked pretty good, but yeah. Um, so potential energy. Any tips on my process? My process is read everything I can. Like I, I read all the stories that they're reading. Um, so there's a joke going on on the internet. I feel deeply in my soul, which is that 
I'm just waiting for a 17 year old girl to fix this COVID-19 thing. As soon as she figures out which of the two hot boys fighting over her, she's going to settle on. I've read all of the young adult fiction and my kids used to do this thing where they'd be like, Hey, tell me a Paw Patrol story. And I would tell them a Paw Patrol story because I'd seen a hundred episodes of Paw Patrol. I knew what the story structure was. Um, I read like, for example, I don't like critical role. It never, it never was a thing for me that I got into, but I got Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount or Wild Mount or whatever, Wild Mount, because I, I knew that there was the way that they structure critical role adventures and stories is interesting to some people. So I wanted to read those. I took them in um, and there's things I got out of it. There's really neat, there's really neat features in there. Though I may not enjoy the show itself, I like the content they're putting out. So the more content you can take in, the more you can, um, the more you can analyze the structure yourself, the easier it is for you to put things up on the fly. For example, if I were to tell you that as a party, you guys are walking along and all of a sudden you see a beggar being uh, beat up by three guards. Every one of you could probably tell the rest of that story a little bit from some experience you've had. And all I did is I, instead of it being, you come, I just did the, the, um, the first thing that you encounter in Lost Minds of Fendelver, except I put it in a city. In Lost Minds of Fendelver, you're walking along and you come across a wagon uh, feathered with arrows and turned on its side. I said, instead, you're walking along and you come across a beggar being beat up by three guards. You can figure it out. It's the, it's the same structure that's in a lot of things. Um, I rely on a lot of my players to take notes because the notes that my players remember are the things that they thought are important to them or they're interested in. So wh what I do is I'll actually ask my players to give me their recap of what happened in the previous session. And that tells me the things that they were engaged with. And then I go off of that. It's super cheating, but it also allows me to play off of what interests them and it refine what I'm doing to meet their, um, to meet their, their interests. All right. So, uh, Daryl Lynn, Derry, Derry Lynn Dar says, do you have any tips on working with specific emotional issues, especially in a collaborative setting? I think that the tip I have is to not specifically work on the emotional issue, but find ways to work on all the emotional issues and spotlight, um, spotlight one issue at a time or spotlight one behavior at a time that you're trying to work with. A tip that I do have um, when it comes to notes, the one thing I do is I keep a post-it note of every player that I have. Um, I have like, so I'll have like five post-it notes stacked with each other. And I, it'll, on the first one, it'll say player one. And then, so what I'll do is I'll see that post-it note with player one on top. And I say, okay, we're, we're going along, we're doing something. I'm like, oh no, player one, you're, you get a note from your grandmother, something horrible has happened and let's go there. So we all run off to help player one's grandmother. And then I take that post-it note that said player one off and I put it on the bottom and it says, okay, next is player three because they're in random order. And I go, you guys get there and you're walking along. Player three, you, a uh, monkey, jumps off the top shelf of grandma's bookshelf and lands on your head. What are you going to do? And what it does is allows me to spotlight each player without, um, in, in their own way without necessarily like, cause you, you don't realize it, but you favor people. If you don't spotlight people, you end up favoring on this way or that way. You're like the person who engages with you the most is the one you end up playing with the most. And by having the rotating post-it notes, it allows me to, to, to spotlight somebody each time we play or each thing we do. And that then engages them without necessarily forcing them. And they don't know it's their turn because one of the things I'll do is I might write those post-it notes. If I have five players, I'll write 25 post-it notes and put them in a random order so that they can't predict the order in which it's going to come. Uh, and it still allows the spotlighting. It still allows the process to happen, but it's not necessarily only engaging with the person who's most, um, not the person who's most responsive. The other thing that I did is when I was working with students who had emotional issues, I gave them, okay, so let me start by saying this. I pre-gen characters for them, but I pre-gen like paint by numbers characters. I gave one person was a was statted as a martial class. One person was st statted as a support class, and one person was statted as a like a DPS class. 
And those were like, I just started there. I didn't give them like actual specific classes or anything like that. But what I did is I allowed the char- the kids to paint the characters the way that they wanted them to be. Because there's two types of characters most people play in the beginning. Some people play themselves. And so what they'll do is they'll paint the character to be themselves. Other people will play the character that's who they want to be. And those types of characters are very informative. In fact, one of my favorite things to do with my students that isn't related to gaming is I'll ask them the question, if you had a million dollars, but you couldn't spend it on yourself, what would you do? And you'd be amazed at how many times kids will say like, hey, I would um, I would buy my mom a house because she doesn't like living in an apartment. Or I would, um, I would pay the money to get my uncle out of jail or whatever, those kind of things. You see what they're worried about. You see the things they care about. It's a very important thing um, to, that kids do. And even when they play themselves, they'll, they'll also spotlight characteristics that they're proud of. And so if they think that they're strong or if they think that they're brave, they'll play up that characteristic and it allows you to then help them gear towards the things that they want. And say, if a kid isn't engaging, if you give him a hat that gives, I I like to give, um, the speaking sombrero to students and it's not an actual sombrero, but like it's a, it's a magic item where you'll, where you'll get like a plus three to all of your social interactions. So a kid who may not be engaged socially suddenly becomes the ones that kids will rely on because they know he's going to roll well. And like she puts on the hat and now she has a plus three to her dice rolls. Well, I'm like, hey, what would you like to say to them? Or what's the idea that you would like to get across? And we build off of that. And that allows you to to focus on the issues but by giving them confidence. So if you know you have a lower likelihood of failing on the dice, you're more likely to safely engage in that in that issue and make it silly, make it fun, have um, um, be a cartoon character with the kids. All right, so um, Vajrayana says, I am a therapist and I use basic D&D stuff in sessions with kids like age 10. However, I'm looking to run a game for a wide range uh, boys and girls club. Would you have a group of kids five to 12? was thinking of using swords and wizard uh, wizardry light. That's not a bad idea, but making it even lighter. Yeah. Any ideas on how um, on this or how otherwise adjust the game for such a young age group? 12 to 5 is a huge range. Middle school is, a, once kids hit middle school, they get into a very weird, scary, like, mindset um, where they can either, like, they go from being sweet and cute to evil in three years, having taught middle school for a long time. Um. But the thing is that I've seen over the years that one thing that's gotten better is that kids have become more helpful to each other. They're still bullying, but if you if you give a kid, if you bring a kid and you say, hey, listen, you know, Yanni, I need you to work with your kid. I need you to work with these younger kids, and I'm going to need you to be a role model for them. And if you give a kid the responsibility and tell them the, the behavioral role you're expecting them to fill – they're going to fill it. They're going to rise to your expectations and it's going to be amazing. Light is light. I would say at most use like three D sixes um, or have a, have one D 20 or something like that. The, the less amount of difference in the dice, and by the way, a secret way of helping people figure out the dice. If you have new players, as I tell them, I'm like, Hey, I'm superstitious. So what I like to do is I like to put the dice with the highest number up, so they learn to land that way. I'm not actually superstitious, but what it does is it gets them to put all of their dice with the highest number up, which means when I say, hey, roll a D8, all they have to do is they have to look for the one that has an eight up, and they can pull that. And they're like, okay, yeah, I can roll that. And they don't they don't feel as stupid by not knowing where the things are. They don't feel as lost by not knowing which dice are up. Um, I hope that helps. Simplicity. And tricks are a really great way to get past learning it and as, and um, assigning roles, which as a, as a therapist, I'm sure you have a pretty good understanding of those things. Yeah, steal, steal the trick of the dice up. It's a great way. I tell it to all the new players I have. And I've heard so many people talk about it. And it's, it's really fun. I don't, I, somebody else I saw use it and I realized it was a great way of doing that. Um, Commander Pete, this reminds me of the first adventure I'm currently preparing for my young kids. Oh, cool. And my older kid and wife who also haven't played. 
One thing I'm, uh, I'm making sure is that the first adventure hits on all the abilities of everyone in the party. So there will be tracking for the ranger, something to identify with the wizard. Yeah, animals, handling for the druid, etc. Yeah. everyone. I want everyone to feel like they have a role in the party. Starfinder is a really great system where everybody has a role and every role is useful. In fact, Starfinder is a really great system for like having a large group because you need more people for that game than less. Um, yeah, there's a lot that you can do. Uh, another educator friend of mine separated several sets of dice for his younger students by what they were and labeled them D20, D12. It was very good for new players. The other thing you can do is um, you can get dice in certain colors. And so if you give like all the D20s are red and all of the, but it, it could get expensive. Um, there's a lot of different ways of, of doing that. The one thing, the other thing that I found that helps, especially when working with emotional learning, is I only introduce new dice when they get a skill that uses it. So it cuts down on the amount of uh, amount of noise in front of the player that is going to stop them from seeing like what that is. So if they don't need a D4, they don't need to have a D4 in front of them. And if there's something comes up where they do need to roll it, I'll hand it to them and say, hey, here's a D4. Can you roll this for me? Um, it's where they only need the D20 and whatever their damage die is in front of them. And that cuts down on a lot of like the overstimulation that they're getting from it. Uh, let's see. I just thought I saw another question or something else in there. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't know. Um, we're actually well, almost approaching the end. Um, any last questions before I sign off and you guys have time to go find your next thing? Because I don't want to go right up to the line because I know some of you have to figure out signing in stuff. So. All right. And by the way, um, once again, I'm going to put the the link for the Discord in there. Uh, you can also actually, if you're on Twitter, you can hit me up at Mr. Underscore Espinos on, uh, ooh, oh, on Twitter. And um, I'm gonna put a link for the GaryCon Discord in there. I'm very easy to find. I'm the one who is dumb enough to start running it. So I have the little crown on my head. If you're in the GaryCon Discord, which by the way, has absolutely just spiked my anxiety because I'm not used to being responsible for like 300 plus people. So, um, and all the, all the moderators and, uh, other admins in the GaryCon discord have been saving my bacon because if it was just me, I would have freaked out and ran away a long time ago. So, um, you guys have been great. Uh, I'm always open to communicating with people. If you have any questions, reach out to me. I will spend all the time in the world talking to you, uh, to help you out. So thank you guys. And hopefully I'll see you next year in Lake Geneva.